For the next several weeks, we're going to be working our our way through the Old Testament book of Daniel. And uh, and I expect that as we're working through, Daniel is, uh, I've never preached through the book of Daniel before. And so I'm very excited about this. Uh, the, The same God that shut the mouths of lions and secured uh, three boys in the fiery furnace. This, the same God also delivered a whole nation into exile. And, and the mystery and the, and the power and the courage and, 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 and the, like, let's be frank, the weirdness of Daniel is, uh, is, is, is going to be a lot of fun for us. And I, and, I, and, I am, and I am leaning into this idea that the same God that was alive and well and at work in Daniel is here today, alive and well and work. Yes, life can be hard, but God is most certainly, certainly good. I expect that as we move through this kind of unique section of our faith story, this, this Daniel story, this is our story. This is our history. This is our family lineage. So that, so that I expect as we're working through our faith story, you and I will be captivated by its mystery, will be inspired by its courage, will be challenged by its message, and, and more than anything, I pray that we are shaped by the God we discover within its pages. And so if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to read together the whole entire chapter, Daniel chapter 1. So, uh, I'm not going to ask you to stand because I don't want you to be distracted. I mean, if you want to stand, you certainly can if that's your, if that's your deal. But if you'd, if you'd like to just follow along, I'd rather you concentrate on that. Daniel chapter 1, we're going to begin uh, reading the first verse all the way through uh, to the end of the chapter. Before we read, let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I ask this morning that you would open up our eyes that we might see the wonders of your word and, and, and give us the grace that we might clearly understand the way of wisdom and, and freely choose to walk with you along the path of life, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put into the treasury of the house of his God. And then the king ordered one of his chief of court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude of every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's own table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezra, chief official, gave them new names. To Daniel, he named him Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Ezra, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Now, why should he see you looking worse than all of the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. And by implication, Daniel's head as well. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the, chief had of, the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Zerah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. And so he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four men, 
God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azera. And so they entered the king's service. In every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story of Daniel, like much of the Old Testament, is, uh, is a story set within the context of exile. Exile is a big deal for the people of God, the writers of the Old Testament. It's a major part of our faith story. We talked about exile a lot, I think, in the past couple years, so we don't want to get too far into all of the particulars about what exile is. But let's just use some of the language that we've been using throughout Pentecost and describe it this way. Exile is the result of a people who have disconnected themselves from their source of life, and they have failed to maintain their course heading, a course heading that will bring them to God. They're losing their identity. They're veering tragically off target. Exile is the result of a people who have collectively modified their flight plan and set out to arrive at some alternative destination. Exile. That's what happens to the people of God when they forget themselves, who, who they belong to, and when, when they forget their history and their faith story, when they lose their way and they step off the path that connects them to life. Exile in Babylon is a singular metaphor, a metaphor that the Bible uses to describe what happens when people stop living the life that God has called them to and subsequently reduced to the consistent struggle for survival in a strange and hostile environment, left to eke out a meager existence in an aggressive and violent world. Let me suggest to you, we're far removed from exile in, in, in the Babylonian sense. But let me suggest to you this morning that exile for us here in the 21st century civilized world can look like that church kid who grew up among us in now an atheist, or that happy couple that were married here, sifting through the wreckage of their relationships that's dissolved and, and the impending divorce. Exile can look like the, the minister of a local congregation in the throes of addiction. It can look like the sexual confusion of a misguided adolescence. Exile can look like the empty moral poverty of a greedy world in a relentless pursuit of just a little bit more. I wonder if we stay connected to the source of life. If, if, I wonder if nothing else changes on our pathway, on our, in our direction. If the, if the road that we're traveling, if the flight that we're flying, if, is that going to bring us home to the Lord? Will that bring us to God's eternal embrace. Or maybe do you get the sense this morning that perhaps, I don't know, you feel a little bit like you're in captivity, living a little in exile. Our, our summer series opens with a detailed description of captivity. The, the, the people of God have been besieged. They have been left without their, 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 their identifying institutions, right? So the king has been displaced. So they're, they're, they're no long, their system of government has been upended. The, the temple has been burned to ruins, and so their religious identification is now gone. And they've been displaced from the land. Their location, their geographical location has been moved. So, so there's nothing there that, that, that can identify them as a people anymore. They're fragmented. There, there's no coherence. There's, there's nothing that says we are God's chosen people. Now we are exiles in Babylon. Now, the Bible has no love for the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, for sure. Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned more than any other foreign tyrant in all of the scriptures, even more than Pharaoh of Egypt, over 90 times in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar arrogantly opposes Yahweh as the one central antagonist of the scriptures. He is, he is 
He has directed a very efficient and ruthless military campaign that extends across the civilized world. And, and one, of the, one of the key things that makes him such, a, such an effective and yet terrible ruler all at the same time is this is three-part plan of conquering that we can pick out here in our text of Daniel chapter 1. The first thing that, that Nebuchadnezzar institutes to, to a place where he's about to conquer is he, he depletes its targets, resources, and he breaks their resolve. Verse 1, chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. He, he didn't allow any of the resources to come in. The people began to grow in this deep sense of hopelessness, like, like they're, they're going to be taken captive. It's only a matter of time. Now, the second thing that, the, that, that Nebuchadnezzar does, is, which I find fascinating and really interesting, is that, is, 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 is that after he besieges the city and he invades it and he, he takes the people captive, he's, he's careful to do this. He, he captures the city's gods, right? He, he, he possesses their, their, the, the gods that they worship. And he carries them off. Though these idols, he carries them off, uh, and as he carries them off, the conquered people, it signifies to them that the gods of Babylon, right, the gods of uh, Marduk is really the, the big god there, but there are others. The gods of Babylon are more powerful than the gods of the cities that they've captivated. So since the Judeans, right, so these are people of God, and the, and the commandments in the Bible, they prevent them from, uh, the Jewish people, from making any cast idols, right? So there's, there's, nothing, for, there's nothing for Nebuchadnezzar to kind of take away. Uh, instead, what he does is he goes into the treasury and he collects all of the objects of worship, right? The bowls and the, the knives and the, and the forks and the... Um, and all, the, and all of the, net, the incense burners and all of the, all of the fun worshiping stuff that the, that the Israelites use in their regular worship, he collects it all, goblets, and we'll hear more about that as the series continues. And, uh, and he takes it into the, his treasury of his, own, of, the, of his own gods. The sacred vessels, the iconic symbols of Israel's worship that, I, that, that identify them as the people of God are carted off with no opposition at all. And now they sit in, in display in Nebuchadnezzar's trophy case as a witness to the superior power of the Babylonian gods that conquered the people of Yahweh. After all, if Yahweh is so powerful, if he, if he is so uh, magnificent and he, and he is kind of who the people of uh, Judah, especially Jerusalem, say he is, how is it that they have been conquered at all? The third thing that Nebuchadnezzar does is he acquires the elite, the educated, the influential, and he relocates them to the central cities of Babylon, here in chapter three, uh, verses 3 and 4. The king ordered the chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility Young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified in the king's palace. He was to teach them, they were to teach them the language and the literature, basically the culture of Babylon. The goal here is for the great cities of Babylon to co-opt and assimilate the very best of the surrounding cities and cultures. That would strengthen the culture of, uh, of Babylon. It would, it, would, it would enhance the Babylonian way. And it would ensure the dominance of the king. And it would eliminate competing alternative ways until, until those ways cease to exist. What's going to happen here is that Daniel and his friends are supposed to be assimilated. They've erased their identity as the people of God. Now they're Babylonians. And the king wants to leverage, he wants to co-opt all of the greatness of other cultures into his own culture. Our, op our opening verse leaves no question about who's in charge. It appears that Nebuchadnezzar exercises unchallenged power across the globe. And he is slowly eliminating the surrounding cultures until they cease to exist. And everything is Babylon. Daniel and his three associates were among the elite that were collected from Jerusalem particularly. 
They were probably from the noble household. And then they were, they were enrolled by the king into this assimilation process designed to develop a proficiency in Babylonian literature, arts, government, and civics. Do they even teach civics anymore? I don't know. The, the, the way that, that we're supposed to do things, religion and culture. For three years, they've been engaged in this program. The purpose of assimilation is to leverage the good and erase their past, to bring about a change of identity. No longer are you the people of Yahweh. Now you're the people of Babylon. And the first step you'll know to changing or to creating a new identity involves a name change. I kind of wanted to do this little game, but we're running out of time. I got stuck down this rabbit hole in research. Google, right? What a, what a trap. Uh, and, 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 I, and I looked up, you know, what are some famous people who went through some name changes? And, 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 uh, and fascinating about the people throughout history and, and what, what caused them to change their name. How many have ever undergone a name change in the, in the congregation? Yep, a lot of our ladies are raising, like when we got married, Becky had, tells the story of, how when we first got married, she's a school teacher, and she stepped into her first classroom after we got married, and she began to really write her name on the board for the class to see, and Mrs., and then she got to the A part, and she was like, hmm, that's weird. <laughs> Mrs. Abrams is my mother-in-law. No one's ever called me that before. How do I, like, there's this weird sort of tension, like, suddenly it becomes real, right, that, that, that who you were before is somehow different now. And so the, the, the first Step in creating a new identity involves a name change. Name, names carry great significance in Middle Eastern culture. Uh, uh, a name will represent uh, the, the, the family character and connections, and it held deep religious significance. A name change, if you're going to change your name, represents a significant reorientation. Things are different now. Names have been changed. We could go through the Bible and start talking about um, uh, biblical characters who have been, who has had their, their whole identity changed by their encounter with God. But for the four Hebrew boys in our story, their names have influence. And it's a shame that we don't pick this up when, um, when we, because we're not familiar with their names or their language. But when we're just doing a cursory reading of Daniel, I think if we knew what their names meant, it, it colors the story a little bit differently early on in the chapter. So let me try to bring some color to the story for you today. The, the name Daniel means my judge is God. So, so, so Daniel answers to God. And, and, and so whenever you read that name throughout the story, what you're going to hear is this person answers to God, not Nebuchadnezzar, not the gods of Babylon. I, I answer to Yahweh. Hananiah's name means Yahweh has shown grace. That like Hananiah, his very name means that, that he is favored by the God of his people, by Yahweh. Mishael has a, has a very interesting name. Uh, his is a question, actually. And the question is posed like this. Who is what God is? Who is what God is? Hananiah, I mean, sorry, Mishael, uh, her, his name states there is no other God like God. No one else compares. Azera, his, God, his, his name means God has been my help, is my fortress and my help. Daniel answers to God. Hananiah is favored by Yahweh. No other being compares to Mishael's God and Azera's God is his help. So whenever these names are read, whenever these names are called, whenever these people are referred to, it reinforces the faith of Jewish people. Their very existence in the world gives witness to the faith of Israel. Mention their names and you've already bore witness to the testimony of the character of God. The people of God have a simple way of being in the world. And just their being, just the mention of their names confronts the powers that live in opposition to the God of life. There is a tension that automatically happens just by mentioning their names. So if these four are going to be assimilated into Babylonian culture, one of the very first things that has to happen is they, they have to undergo a name change, right? We can't have people with the name Daniel running around trying to be Babylonians. That doesn't work for us. And so they, they change his name to Belshazzar. Baal, or the gods of, the gods of Babylon, protect his life now. And, uh, and given the name Shadrach, at the command of the gods of Babylon, 
Mishael's name was changed to Meshach, which is also still a question. Who is like the gods of Babylon? Now is the question that asks. And Abednego, the servant of the gods of Babylon. These names were calculated to significantly and substantially shift the allegiance of these four to their new direction in life. Culture always seems to work in opposition to the mission of God, doesn't it? And the culture that we live in tries hard to co-opt our identities and and it will try to tell us who we really are in a desperate attempt to define us and to leverage our good and to erase our past and assimilate us into its culture. Now when we exist, because Christian people have a, a unique way of being in the world, and when we walk in our world along the path of life, we automatically create somewhat of a tension with the culture of our world. We don't play the same game. Right? We, we, we are defined by another king. And as the first chapter of the book of Daniel unfolds, and, and in these three, Daniel and his three associates are confronted with a test that will determine where their loyalties actually lie. It, it, it's the first and probably the lesser of the three tests that Daniel and his friends will face. Um, we'll talk more about those as the summer progresses. But Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azera, they, they are assigned a daily allotment of Babylonian food. Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about their diet, actually. I, I think there has been a lot of printed unnecessarily about the particularities of the menu. Contrary to what some people understand, the story in Daniel was not written to offer future generations like ours a sanctified nutrition plan. That's not what's going on here. The, the author couldn't begin to understand what we've done with the text when we talk about uh, this is the diet that God's people are supposed to go into. Uh, the diet is simply a catalyst for Daniel to stand for the values of his community of faith and, 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 to, and to be a part of his people, to remember and to be accountable to his God. It proves, um, it proves to be a non-threatening way for Daniel to stay accountable to God and answer to him. God is his judge, remember. I do, however, find it a a little bit interesting that that Daniel pushes back against the menu and not so much against the name change. I think if it was me, I would probably, that that would be a, a stronger hill to die on, but I wasn't there at the time. And so Daniel is neither arrogant or belligerent in his protest. I love this part about him, honestly. In fact, throughout the entire book of Daniel, Daniel never displays any anti Babylonian opinions. He's never vocal in his criticism. He seems to be fully loyal to the success of his captors. He is fully aware that Babylon is not his home, and he takes the position of a missionary in residence. This is my job now. I've been relocated to a culture, to a city, to a people that are not mine. And my job here, my job here is missionary in residence. Daniel embodies a subversive faith that quietly but very effectively undermines the power structures of Babylon. This is the point of the story. So so if you don't catch anything else, catch this point. Daniel embodies a subversive faith that quietly and very effectively undermines the power structures of Babylon. So for three years now, while Daniel and his friends are in this college learning the culture of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar operated under the, under the delusion that he was in charge that he had orchestrated all of the events of his success and that he was rewriting the history and the identity of God's people. The king believed that that Babylonian culture could co-opt the the best of the faithful people of God and leverage the best for his own political influences. He could weaponize their faithfulness and their goodness against his enemies and his, his people, his nation would be better for it. The book of Daniel sits here in our faith story as a testimony against power schemes and political strategies and tricks and initiatives of an ungodly culture that is disconnected from life and has lost its way. The book gives witness that that testifies. It says something like this. You know what? You could remove God's chosen people from their homes if you had to. 
and you could remove their tax-exempt status and their privilege in society, and you could close their sanctuary or burn their temple, and you could burn their books, and you could persecute their communities. You can oppress God's people and ridicule them and dismiss them and shove them to the margins. You can carry them off into exile, and you can try to assimilate them into your culture, and you could confuse them with media, and you could try to persuade them. But this is the thing, friends. God is God in the temple on Saturday as Jewish people gather. And he's God here in the sanctuary on Sundays as we come to worship. But God is also God in exile in Babylon. He's also God in the ghetto streets of the Jewish hostile land. He's God here in the United States, but he's also God in China and Russia and the Ukraine and Pakistan and Somalia. God is God in Washington, D.C., but he's also God at Eagle Pass, Texas. He's God at Chestnut Hill, and he's God at Mass and Cass. Chapter 1 of our summer series ends on this good note. Daniel and his faithful associates, they take a risk. They position themselves counterculturally against power, and they survive with their heads still attached to their shoulders. Essentially, They seem to have passed the test. But the more I wrestled with this story, and it wasn't until late on Thursday where I began to discover something very interesting, something I hadn't anticipated and something I hadn't really uh, thought that I would discover. What what if Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are not the ones being tested in our story? This whole diet thing really wasn't about them anyway. What if the whole book is not really about the faithfulness of Daniel in exile? What if the story is not even really about Daniel at all, the, the, the book that bears his name? What, what if I completely missed the main character altogether? And up until this point in the sermon, we haven't really mentioned him much if you think about it. What if this whole book is really n- not, not about Daniel at all, but, but is entirely about the faithfulness of God to a people in exile. What if that's the point, really? The chief question that has to be answered to people who are in exile, in order for us to maintain our identity in this foreign and hostile land, the question is this, is God among us or is he not? To ask the same question from a couple sermons ago, have our bones been dried up? And our hope gone? Is God among us or is he not? Has Yahweh been defeated as his people are carried off in Babylon? Has he rejected us as his people and gone on to find somebody else? Has Yahweh been defeated by the gods of Babylon? Has he been defeated by the disease of cancer? Has he been replaced by Wall Street? Has he been co-opted by our government? Has he been rendered irrelevant by our media and incompetent by our increasing violence? Is God overwhelmed by the issues that overwhelm us and keep us in exile? The difficulties that we experience and overwhelm us, do they overwhelm him too? The question answered in chapter 1 and all throughout the book of Daniel is the resounding yes, he is God in exile too. Three big lessons from the first chapter as we push forward in our summer series. The first one is the most important. In spite of outward appearance, it doesn't matter how it looks on the outside, God is still God. He always has been and he always will be. I didn't see it before, and shame on me for not noticing because it's kind of my job, actually. The main character in our story is not the king or Daniel or Hananiah or Mishael or Zerah. The hero of our story is God. He is the chief actor. King Nebuchadnezzar is a puppet, and and Israel itself is completely passive in the book. They don't really do anything but complain a little bit. With with, with just three little verbs. It's interesting. God does, well, God does one thing in chapter one. One thing three times. And the verb is give. That's it. One thing, three times in the whole chapter, and suddenly he's the hero. In verse 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, along with the articles from the temple. Nebuchadnezzar didn't conquer, and he didn't steal. The Lord gave him over. Verse 9, 
God gave Daniel favor in the eyes of the chief official. Verse 17, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of learning to Daniel and his associates. The king thinks that he has power and control. The people think that they have been abandoned and conquered. But the circumstances of Daniel's life are not an accident. God has placed him and his friends in this position in exile, not to preserve their existence, but to thrive and have life. Not to assimilate into the culture, but to serve as missionaries in residence. The evidence is clear. The same God who was with the people in the temple in Jerusalem is now camping out with them in the slums of the Jewish ghettos in Babylon. First thing, first lesson, God is God in exile. Second thing, because he's God in exile and because he shows up, uh, his people can live confidently into the future. But, but the faithful convictions of God's people often run counter to the convictions of the empire. You've noticed, right? But, like we're not on the same page as the empire. There's a vast, vast difference. We, you and I, we are aliens and strangers in this world. We are immigrants and sojourners in this place. My allegiance is to the cross. I will not be co-opted by the empire. I will not allow my brothers and sisters in faith to be re reduced to a voting block to leverage in some political campaign. There is something fundamentally countercultural about a missionary in residence. To quote the words from that famous preacher from Nazareth, our kingdom is not of this world. Our allegiance is not buried into this world. You and I, we have a way of being in the world that fully engages, fully engages our culture while refusing to be co-opted by it. Like Daniel and you know, like Jesus, we work to undermine power structures that oppose God's plan for life. And we work very hard to embody the kingdom values in our community. Second thing, or third thing rather, living out these convictions of the kingdom even especially in opposition to the empire, requires risk. This, this life is going to cost you something. Living like Daniel or like Jesus, it, it, it will cost you something. I mean, think about some of the things that they faced. Living the life of Daniel, living the life of Jesus will cost you something. It's likely, friends, that your family won't understand your obsession with the kingdom. It's likely that will happen. It's likely that your coach will not tolerate your absence on Sunday. That's, that's likely. It's likely that your bank account will not recover from your Christian generosity. You can, you can probably plan on that. It's likely you'll lose a friend or two. It's likely that you will become the target of somebody else's church hurt or misunderstanding. They'll take that out on you, probably. That, that, that might happen. It's likely that you might have to give up a free Saturday or a whole week's vacation. It's likely that, that, that you, when you reach out, you'll be rejected more times than you are accepted. It, it will cost you something. Be prepared for that. Embodying the kingdom of God in Babylon requires sacrifice. Becoming the missionary in residence is going to cost you something. And when it does, I want us to see it for what it really is. It's a test. It's a test, and if the songs that we sang and the testimonies that we give already today mean anything, it means it's okay because God is faithful in exile. He shows up in exile. The, 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 the test asks the question, who's Lord here? Who's Lord here? The, the test asks the question, where do I pledge my allegiance, the kingdom of God or the empire? Will God show up for me here in exile? And even if he doesn't show up, will I remain faithful? These are the questions we'll wrestle with this summer. We ask the question, can I trust God in exile? When the question might actually be, can God trust us in exile? Three things. Living out the conviction of the kingdom in exile requires risk. The faithful, secondly, the faithful convictions of the kingdom often run countercultural to the convictions of the empire. We show up uniquely in the world. 
And last above it all, God is God. Even in exile, he shows up for the people who have been shoved along the margins. He escorts those who find themselves eking out an existence in the Jewish ghettos of Babylon. This is not just some mysteriously um, kind of captivating story ripped from the pages of history. This is our faith story. The, the, these are our people This is our family lineage and heritage. This is our experience. God shows up for us. He shows up for our people in their times of struggle and loss. They trusted him then. We can trust him now. I'd like for us to re-sing that song, Evidence. Because I really want that to be like the last thing that you... That you, that the last word that you hear as we put out. And it's a, it's a fun word because we're singing it. So it's not only one that sort of can wash over you, but it's, it's, a, it's a word that you can sing into and you can speak. And you can do it for yourself, but you can also sing it for somebody else. And so uh, I've asked the music team to come kind of lead us through this moment of evidence again. And, and let us, you know, stand if you want, if it's your testimony. Raise your hand if you want, if it's your testimony. Or sit and, and, and just kind of, Kind of scroll through the people in your mind who you want this to be the testimony for.